Okay, now I think it's working. All right, so 55 questions, all multiple choice. We're also going, um, let's see, about 10 questions going over um, kind of conceptual questions, conceptual stuff on inference, and I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail on that. So inference, hypothesis tests, confidence intervals. Stuff like that. Okay. There will be about five questions um, asking which statistical method is appropriate to use for the given scenario. About 35 questions, give or take a few. Uh, this will be just different, um, different hypothesis tests or different statistical inference methods. Okay, different statistical methods. So covering. Um, you know, t tests, etc. T tests, uh, chi squared tests, ANOVA, uh, correlation, all of the different uh, uh, inference methods, you know, that we've covered, um, just going over having you carry those out. Okay? And then there's probably just some five miscellaneous um, statistics related questions. <clears throat> okay. So let's, uh, let's start off with this, the, uh, which statistical method is appropriate to use for the given scenario. And then uh, I'll do a very quick overview of the different statistical methods. And then we'll go into some of the conceptual stuff. OK? Mm, something. Okay, so which test, when to use which test? Or I'll say which method. All right, so, so we start off and we ask the thing that you're interested in, the response, okay? The response variable. This is whatever variable it is that you are interested in studying we say it can be numeric or categorical. And then, um, and then we, uh, so if you have a numeric response, we ask, we then ask, you know, what about the predictor? Okay, do we have a predictor variable? Um, and, you know, it's even possible not to have a predictor variable, but, um, you know, we ask about what about the predictor? Okay, and so we can have a numeric predictor. Or a categorical predictor. or no predictor. Okay. 
So if you have a numeric response and a numeric predictor, then that means you are going to do correlation. Okay? So this is chapter 12, correlation and linear regression. So if you have two numeric variables and you're exploring, is there a relationship between the two numeric variables? That's going to be correlation and linear regression. Let me go down, jump down to the no predictor. If there's no predictor, then you're going to have a confidence interval for mu. OK, I think this is all. Uh, we really covered for uh, having no predictor. So you take a sample, you're not as trying to make a associate with another variable, you're just making a confidence interval from mu. Okay. Technically there is like a t-test for one sample. We didn't really cover that. Um, it's essentially just the flip side of confidence interval from mu. It's, Whatever conclusion you make, confidence interval from you will be equivalent to a t-test for one sample. Okay. Anyway, categorical predictor, we can have, um, if you have only two categories, okay, then uh, I'm going to run out of space here. Um, you can have, uh, sorry, let me... Let me just crop this chunk, and then I'm going to slide this whole thing over. Just chop that. OK. OK, so with two categories, you can have um, two independent, independent groups. And if they are independent groups, and, uh, and the data seems normal, normal-ish, then you will have t-test for independent groups. Okay. If you have severe outliers, So let me just write this normal-ish. OK, if you have severe outliers, then you would want to do uh, the Wilcoxon-Mann-Whitney test. If you have two categories, but the uh, groups are linked, Okay, then you will have paired groups. And we only covered one test, and that's the t-test for paired data. The book covers other um, paired grouping tests, but we did not cover those in our class. All right. On the other hand, if you have a categorical response, you can technically have a numeric predictor. This was not covered, so I'm going to just put this in red. Uh, uh, numeric predictor. This is not covered, and that's logistic regression. But uh, we co we co we'll cover the scenarios for uh, categorical predictor and no predictor. Okay. So if you have a categorical response and a categorical predictor, 
That will be the chi-squared test for independence. And for if you have no predictor, then you can have the chi-squared test, I should say chi-squared goodness of fit test. And you also have a chi-squared goodness of fit test is for more than two categories or I, I should say two or more, two or more categories. And if you have only two categories, you can also do a confidence interval uh, for P uh, based on P squiggle, P tilde, and that's if uh, only two categories. Only two categories means yes or no. Okay, it's this thing or it's not this thing. And I think this covers all of the statistical methods that we covered in our class. Okay, Are there any questions here? So let's just do a. We'll do a quick check to make sure. We'll we'll see. So. Uh, um, Quick check of our understanding. Let's see. Let me close all of these other files. Practice final and get rid of these things. Let's see. Flip flip. Gosh, there's so many. Okay, so here's, a, here's some examples that we can go through. All right, so you guys have your, your map of different statistical things that we've learned. All right, so let's try this out. So this is um, from the book. It says, researchers conducted a randomized double-blind clinical trial in which some patients with schizophrenia were given the drug clozapine and others were given Haloperidol. After one year, 61 of 163 patients in the clozapine group showed clinically important improvement in symptoms compared with 51 out of 159 in the haloperidol group. Okay, so don't shout out your answer, just think of your answer here. Okay, identify the type of statistical method that is appropriate for this data, but don't actually conduct the analysis. Okay, well, yeah, so just think. What is the statistical method we would use for this? Okay, so we gave some patients clozapine and others haloperidol. After one year, 61 of 163 patients showed clinically important improvement for clozapine and then for haloperidol, 51 out of 159. Okay. Do you guys have an answer in mind? Yes? Okay, so what is the appropriate test to use? So we have a categorical response, right? And what's the response? Did they have clinically important, clinically important improvement? Is that what it said? Yeah, clinically important improvement. So did they show improvement? And we have a categorical predictor. Which drug were they given? So we will use the chi-squared test for independence. Okay, and so for, for this one, for this analysis, we would, uh, you know, you would do like uh, one of these things, right? Uh, improved, no improvement, uh, clozapine, haloperidol, and then you'd put your numbers in and do your chi-squared test this way, okay?
All right, let's move. Something is going on here. Okay. And this is bugging out on me. Okay. Uh, okay. A biologist collected data on the height measured in inches and peak expiratory flow, a measure of how much air a person can expire measured in liters per minute for 10 different women. And here's the data. Subject 1 had a height of 63 and peak expiratory of 410, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And it wants to know, is peak expiratory flow related to height? Okay. Again, don't shout out your answer. Just think about it for a second here. Identify the type of statistical method excuse me, that is appropriate for these data. So we want to know, is there a relationship between height and peak expiratory flow? Okay, so what kind of, uh, what is the appropriate method to use here. We will be doing, uh, we have a numeric response, peak expiratory flow, and a numeric predictor, someone's height. So we will be using correlation and linear regression to see if there is a relationship between uh, the two variables. Okay. Okay, so you can do correlation, linear regression, all right. Let's, uh, let's look at this next one. <clears throat> a geneticist self-pollinated pink flower snapdragons and produced 97 progeny with the following colors, 22 red plants, 50, 52 pink plants, and 23 white plants. The purpose of this experiment was to investigate a genetic model that states that the probabilities of red, pink, and white are 0 0.25, 0 0.50, and 0.25, respectively. What is the appropriate statistical method for this problem? So what would we do for that one? Okay. So our response is what color plant grew. So that's a categorical response. And what kind of predictor do we have? There's no predictor, right? There's, we're not trying to see if there's a relationship between the color that grew and any other variable. We just want to know, do these proportions fit? So there's no predictor there. And we have more than two categories. So we're going to use a chi-squared goodness of fit test. We want to know, how good is the fit between the data we see and these proportions are the model that we have in mind. So far, so good. Okay. All right. Let's uh, let's do one more of these. Okay. Biologists were interested in the distribution of trees in a wooded area. They intend to use the number of trees per 100 square meter plot as the, their unit of measure. However, they were concerned that the shapes of the plot might affect the data collection. To investigate the possibility, they counted the number of trees in square plots, round plots, and rectangular plots. The data are shown in the table. What type of analysis is appropriate for these data? So we have square, round, and rectangular, and we are counting how many trees showed up in that in each of those plots. Huh? Did I not include ANOVA? Oh my gosh. I am I'm embarrassed that this happened. OK, so we have two categories. <laughs> so I need to have uh, more than two categories, or two or more categories. I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed. OK, so two or more categories, this needs to be ANOVA, yeah. You are right. I did not include that in this chart. OK. So well, that is our answer. <laughs> so here, uh, we have a numeric response, 
categorical predictor, uh, the shape of the plot, but if you have more than two categories, you've got to do ANOVA. Okay? You can do ANOVA with just two, but uh, the results will boil, well, theoretically should boil down to uh, the same as a t-test for uh, independent groups. Technically, the, uh, the standard deviation that you would use in that t-test is a little different, but eh, whatever. Uh, they're essentially the same, so this is what you have. Yeah, there's technically there's two t-tests for independent groups. One is with a pooled standard error, and one is a non-pooled standard error. And we teach the non-pooled one, but if you did ANOVA for two categories, it's equivalent to doing it with yeah, anyway, with the pooled standard deviation. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so that's. Uh, so you have that. Um, you know, one, one thing to keep in mind is depending on the, uh, the way the um, variable is measured might change it from being a numeric response to a categorical response or from a numeric predictor to a categorical predictor. Okay? So for example, we, when we think of the variable age, age we generally think as a numeric variable okay but uh, you know if you do any kind of if you read up on like Nielsen data or things like that they turn age into a category you know they have the ages you know under 18 you know 19 to 25 and 26 to 34 they 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 categorize the age okay so it's no longer a numeric variable so if you were dealing with um, you know, data on, you know, Nielsen TV ratings or whatever, you would have a categorical um, predictor there for age because it's, um, they, they chop it up. So, um, so keep that in mind because, uh, you know, as you read it, you have to decide is this being recorded numerically or, you know, in a categorical form. If it, you know, a, a, a clue is if it says, if there, it provides a unit next to the variable being measured, it's going to be numeric, right? If it says height measured in inches, you know it's a numeric variable, okay? If, there, if it gives you some kind of unit, you know, liters per minute, uh, number of pounds, that's numeric variable. Any uh, questions or issues with this? Okay, so you'll you'll see a handful of questions covering uh, which which statistical test is appropriate. Okay, so let's uh, let's go through and uh, and we'll talk about the different statistical methods. So I said. Uh, you know, 35 questions covering the different statistical methods. So that will be things like, um, so for each method, especially, you know, if it's a hypothesis test, you should know what are the correct hypotheses to use. And you should know both um, symbolically, or you know, expressed in you know both the, the symbolic representation of a hypothesis, or um, in a sentence. I don't. How, how do I say symbolic versus text <laughs> representation? What's the opposite of? Symbolic representation, textual <laughs> representation. Okay, and then you should know, you know, calculate either the uh, you know the standard error, uh, 
if there is one, standard error or test statistic, and p-value. And then um, know the appropriate conclusion, or yeah, make, I should say, make the appropriate conclusion and know what it means in the context of the problem. So don't just stop at reject the null hypothesis, but say this provides evidence that you know the mean of population one is different from the mean of population two, or something like that. Uh, so that applies to the hypotheses tests. Um, you know, for confidence intervals, also know how to make the appropriate conclusion. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess that's that's that. Okay, so I'll just uh, very quickly kind of blast through all the different statistical methods. Just a recap, make sure you know we have the correct hypotheses for each of these things. Okay, so we'll start off with the t test or independent groups. Okay, your null hypothesis will be that mu1 equals mu2, or equivalently, you could write the difference between the two mu's is zero, and then the alternative is that they are not equal, or one is greater than, or less than. And also it's equivalent okay so that is symbolically and textually we could write um, the mean of population one whatever whatever that is, is the same as the mean of population 2, okay? And the alternative is basically is different is greater or is less than the mean of population 2. I'll write it over here. Okay, so whatever you know, whatever population one is men and population two women or, you know, smokers versus non-smokers or whatever it might be. You're two different populations. Okay, that's what you have. And then your test statistic is going to be y bar one minus y bar two over the standard error where the standard error is that thing. And then I think you get, and then you know, you look up in the t-table with uh, degrees of freedom equal to n1 plus n2 
minus 2. Okay, I should say approximate degrees of freedom. And so that's, uh, that's what we do for that. And then you guys know the conclusions. If p value is bigger than alpha or less than alpha, I think, I think you guys got that part down. OK, so that's the t-test for independent groups. I should use this as a guide, huh? OK. Um, so next up, we will, I'll do. Um, t-test for paired data. Okay. So symbolically, we write that the mu mean difference is equal to 0, and the um, alternative is that it's not equal to 0, or greater than, or less than 0, Okay. symbolically. And then as text, we would say, The mean difference is 0, and the mean difference is not or is greater than uh, or not equal to 0. Okay, And the idea being, being um, you know, you have y1 y2, and you have the y difference, which is y1 minus y2, or y2 minus y1, however you have it set up. And again, um, once you have that, you pretty much ignore, ignore these columns and use only the, the differences. So your test statistic is equal to d bar, technically minus 0, divided by the standard error. And the standard error is standard deviation of the difference column divided by the square root of n. Okay, So this would be the difference column. And you would have, you know, some, you know, standard deviation of the difference and the mean difference is d bar. Okay, and so you don't just ignore these other two columns once you get your difference column, and then you look up in the t table. Uh, with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Okay. So the important thing here for paired data is that you're only making a statement about the difference, the mean difference between uh, y1 and y2, or the before and the after, or something like that. You're not making statements about y1 and y2 themselves directly, just in the relationship between those. So there's only mu of the difference. Okay, so don't do mu1 and mu2. Okay, that's the t-test for paired data. All is that. We've got, then we have the uh, Wilcoxon Man Whitney. Okay. So this is, we have independent groups. Generally, um, fairly small sample sizes. example, less than 25. Not necessarily. I mean, you can have things larger than 25 and still use Wilcox and Man Whitney. And then you have some um, 
generally there's some some indication that the underlying data is um, not not normal like having outliers extreme outliers okay, so that's when we use the Wilcox and Van Whitney and we don't have a symbolic uh, because it's a non-parametric test there's no symbolic representation for the um, hypo hypotheses okay kind of the point of non-parametric tests. Okay, and so um, the null hypothesis is that, you know, the population that corresponds to sample one produces, or I should say, has the same distribution uh, as the population that corresponds to sample 2. Okay, and of course population that corresponds to sample one is just kind of a, a stand-in for whatever the problem actually states. Okay, but this would be the generic one. And then the alternative would be that I'm going to just write population one um, has a distribution that produces you know different larger or smaller values than um, population 2 To do this test, you know you have, um, you know your values. This is uh, sample one and sample two. You know your values here, values here, and you basically count how many in the other sample. are smaller than the current value. Okay, you total it up, total up those counts. The larger column, the larger total is the test statistic U, and you look that up in the Wilcox and Man Whitney table. Okay. Whose probabilities were calculated through basic permutations of data. Okay. All right, so that's Wilcox and Man Whitney. So that's um, t tests, pair t tests, Wilcox and Man Whitney. 
Okay, we'll keep uh, keep churning along here. Uh, we have the chi-squared goodness of fit test. Okay, the null hypothesis here is that proportion of category one is equal to you know some number. I'm going to just make up like. 40% and uh, in proportion of category 2 is equal to uh, some other number you know I'm, I'm just making these up okay of course and then the alternative is you know at least one proportion is wrong okay. textually we would write the proportions uh, I'm sorry the population has you know the following proportions uh, for each category And then it would look just like this, right? You know, category one equals forty percent. There's there's no way around it. Okay, category two is equal to sixty percent, or something like that. Um, you know, and and in this case, when you have only two categories, you can have um, directional alternatives. Okay, so you can have directional alternative. for um, cases with only two categories. Okay, if you have more than two categories, must be non-directional. And then you calculate chi-squared statistic as observed minus expected squared over expected added up for all categories. And you look up in the chi-squared table with uh, degrees of freedom equal to number of categories minus 1. And closely related to the chi-squared goodness of fit test, um, especially when you have only two categories, will be the confidence interval for P based on P tilde. Okay, P tilde is the Wilson adjusted sample proportion, which we calculate as Y plus 2 divided by N plus 4. Okay, as opposed to p, the traditional sample proportion, which is just y over n. Okay, so we use this, and then our ninety-five percent confidence interval is equal to p tilde plus or minus one point nine six times the square root of p tilde times 1 minus p tilde divided by n plus 4. Okay. And if a certain value p0 is within the interval 
We do not have evidence. that P is different from P0. And the, uh, the flip side is also true. If P0 is not within the interval, then you do have evidence that the population proportion P is different from P0. Okay. Is this OK? Are there questions on that? So an example case, so we could we could do a, yeah, we can do a re, re, two related examples here. Um, yeah, let's let's think here. Okay. Is is this uh, okay with everybody? Everyone got this down? Okay. So we'll do an example of that. So let's say. Um, what proportion, you know, we want to know what proportion of people, I don't know, <laughs> um, own a convertible. Convertible car, that is. Um, I don't know what other convertible. Okay, so uh, let's say you, um, you survey. 200 people, and yeah, maybe more. Okay, 250 people, and I don't know, how many out of 250 people own a convertible? 15. I have no idea. I'm making this up. Okay? <laughs> 15 own a convertible. Okay, so we'll do, um, so with this data, we can do both a chi-squared goodness of fit test if we have proportions in mind, and we can also just do the confidence interval for um, P, okay? So we'll just do one, uh, we'll say there's a proportion in mind, and we say, you know, does this data provide evidence that um, the proportion, or maybe I'll just say that, um, OK, I'll, I will do it this way. Less than 5% of the population uh, own a convertible. Actually, that's not going to work, OK, but anyway. I'm, I'm going to have to fix this in a moment here, and, and we'll, we'll discuss, OK? All right, so first we'll do, um, we'll do the confidence interval for P based on P tilde, OK? So P tilde would be what? 15 plus 2 divided by 250 plus 4. Set up. Okay. So seventeen divided by two fifty four. Okay, and I get point zero six six nine. Okay, and so my confidence interval would be is P tilde plus or minus one point nine six times the square root of P tilde times 1 minus P tilde over n plus 4. Okay, so let's figure out what the standard error is. So the standard error is going to be this times 1 minus that. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm not even bothering in typing in 0 0.0669 because I have it stored as my answer. And I'm going to divide by uh, n plus 4, so 254. 
and I take the square root of this number, and I get my standard error is 0 0.01568. Okay, and I'm going to multiply that times 1.96. Okay, and so I have 0 0.0669 plus or minus 0 0.0307. Okay, so I'll add that to points, uh, 0 0.0669. And so on the high end, I have 0 0.0976. And on the low end, I have 0 0.0669 minus 0 0.0307, 0 0.0362. Okay. And so the question, um, so here I have less. But uh, uh, when you do a confidence interval, you can only a answer the question, is it different from 5%? Okay. So do we have evidence that the proportion is, uh, you know, do we have evidence? that the proportion is different from 5%. Okay, so when you do a confidence interval, you can only answer is different. And so what's our answer to this question? No, because 5% is between 0 0.036 and 0 0.097. So we say, um, no, we do not have different evidence that the proportion is different from 5%. I feel like the proportion of convertible owners is like 1% <laughs> or something. I, um, but I, I'm just, I, you know, I just made up this info. OK. So based on this data that we collected, which probably is not a truly representative sample, we do not have evidence that the proportion is different from 5%. OK. OK. Um, I said we can also answer this same question doing a chi-squared goodness of fit test. OK. So our null hypothesis would be proportion or probability that someone owns a convertible is equal to 5%. And then the alternative here would be that the convertible is less than 0 0.05. Okay? But when we took our when we look at our data, what do we see? We see p hat is actually going to be 15 over 250. So 15 divided by 250, this is 0 0.06. Okay, That's bigger than 0 0.05, so we're going to have no evidence to support this alternative the way it's written. Okay, So we could change it to leave it um, as a single-sided test or directional test. And we could change this to, uh, whoops, what tool did I do there? Uh, we could change this to be greater than. OK? All right, so now I can answer this question. Is that OK so far with everyone? OK, so here we need, uh, so our observed would be convertible owners. How many do I have? Convertible, I have 15. And non-convertible would be what? If I have 250 people total. 235, right? So that I have a total of 250. So this is what I observed, OK? My expected for convertible would be n times p, or 250, times 0 0.05. OK? 250 times 0 0.05 gives me 12.5. I'm expecting 
12 and a half convertibles and non-convertible would then be 237.5 so that it adds up to 250. Okay, and I'm, and I'm running out of space here, but then I would do my chi-squared statistic as, you know, observed 15 minus expected 12.5 quantity squared divided by 12.5 plus 235 observed minus expected 237.5 quantity squared over 237.5. And then I would uh, have a chi-squared statistic with one degree of freedom. I would look that up in the table, and I would get my answer that way. So that is uh, chi-square goodness, chi-square goodness of fit and confidence interval for p and p tilde. Everyone got that? Okay, uh, and then we have chi-squared test for independence. And so here, your null hypothesis is that, you know, categorical variable one is independent of categorical variable two. Okay, so that, that is, uh, you know, written as text. Symbolically, we have um, multiple ways of stating this. We can say the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A. Or we can also write um, probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A given not B or B complement. or probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. Okay? These are all ways of symbolically expressing that variable 1, in this case, which would be uh, A, categorical variable 1, a is independent of categorical variable 2, which I've written as B. Okay, but whatever it is, right? For, we might be talking about um, eye color and hair color, or gender and career choice, or right? whatever, okay? And then the alternative is basically not independent um, or if you wanted to make it directional you could say um, you know A is more likely if B has happened than if B hadn't happened or something like that okay so or so you could say probability of A given B is not equal to the probability of A given, uh, I'll say not B, Oops. or you know greater than or less than. And this kind of expresses that B makes it more or less likely for A to happen. <coughs> okay, and then so here you will have um, a, a two-way table of some kind. Okay, so you'll have A 
not A, B, not B, maybe even more categories. Okay, and this will be total B, total not B, total A, and total not A. And so this will be your observed. You'll have your observed table and then your expected table. Uh, same, same thing. OK, but each cell will be, um, you do uh, row total times column total divided by grand total. And then your chi-squared statistic, observed minus expected, quantity squared over expected for all internal cells. Okay. And then degrees of freedom is equal to number of rows minus 1 times number of columns minus 1. ANOVA, okay. uh, so symbolically we would write mu1 equal to mu2 equal to mu3, etc, 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 or, you know, all groups have the same mean. And then the alternative, we don't really have a symbolic representation for the alternative. You know, we just say at least one group has a different mean. Create the um, the table source degrees of freedom sum of squares mean squares f okay I should say this is one way ANOVA okay and you have uh, between groups and then within groups Let me just uh, and total total uh, degrees of freedom is total number of points minus 1 between groups is number of groups minus 1 and within groups is total number of points minus uh, number of groups Your sum of squares, so I should also say um, we have the grand mean, uh, y double bar is equal to n, n times y bar for each group divided by n dot. So let me distinguish, I can just write n times y bar, and we know that that's multiplication. So between the groups, we take each group mean, subtract off the grand mean, we square that difference, multiply it by n, and we add that up for every single group. And then the within groups, we take, um, well, I'm just going to do the, the shortcut, which is n minus 1 times 
the group group's uh, standard deviation squared. Okay. You don't need this, but I can throw it on here. Y bar, oh, not Y bar, Y minus Y double bar squared summed for uh, everything. Okay, mean squares is always sum of squares divided by degrees of freedom. And then F is going to be mean squares between divided by mean squares within. I hesitate that I that the book puts the n in front of the y minus y bar. I don't think I think you guys won't get thrown off by it, but it, you know I don't want to I don't want to take the risk of anybody getting thrown off by that. So let me just double check n minus one s squared. Good. Oh, they do put the n in front of the y bar minus y double bar. I hope. I hope nobody cares. But I'll, I guess I'll, I'll move it over here just <laughs> now that even looks even looks even worse. Ah, rules of multiplication. The order doesn't matter. Okay, but you have that. All right, and then so we have ANOVA and then F, and then you look up with uh, you know numerator degrees of freedom and denominator degrees of freedom but you don't have to you know I'm not going to give you an F table and you don't need to use the F table on the test but you have to be able to make uh, the ANOVA table Okay, and then the last statistical method is a correlation and then linear regression, okay? So correlation, so first we'll start off with calculating correlation. The correlation coefficient r is equal to the sum product uh, it's technically the sum product of you know all the z's for x times all the z's for y times 1 over n minus 1 but uh, we're going to uh, expand that to be uh, each point minus uh, x bar x minus x bar times y minus y bar we're going to sum that up, and then I'm going to have on the outside n minus 1, standard deviation of x, standard deviation of y. Is, is, that, is that okay? Do I, should I go over this again, or are you guys good? Okay, and then um, and then we have the uh, test for significant correlation. And symbolically, we write rho is equal to zero versus rho is not equal to zero, greater than zero, or less than zero. And in words, we say. Um, there is no correlation between x and y in the population, whatever x and y stand for in the population, versus the alternative, there is, and you can say positive or negative, negative. 
correlation between x and y in the population. Okay, and then so for that you use the test statistic r times the square root, uh, let me think, n minus 2 divided by 1 minus r squared. Let me just verify that. Yes. Okay, with degrees of freedom equal to n minus 2, t table. Value, I'm sorry? The value should be larger than the line. The value should be larger than, I'm, I'm so sorry. So when we decide whether it's Significant or not? not? Yeah, so I mean, it's just like a regular hypothesis test. You look this up and you get a p-value. Right. And uh, you know maybe you choose alpha equal to 0 0.05. And is your p-value bigger or smaller than alpha? And and you decide whether or not your correlation that you observed is significant or indicative that there's truly is correlation in the population. Okay, so that is the test for correlation. And, uh, and then linear regression is about fitting the line y hat equal to b0 plus b1x. So the slope b1 is equal to r times the standard deviation of y divided by the standard deviation of x. And the intercept is always going to be y bar minus the slope times x bar. I should just verify that. See, every textbook they use, yeah, good. They use different letters. So this one uses B0 and B1, and then the other textbook I teach is uses A and B. And <laughs> but the slope and the intercept always will have this. At least for the, uh, we call this the ordinary least squares OLS, OLS regression line. Okay. This minimizes the squares of the residual. Minimizes the squares of residuals. What is a residual? You guys remember? So the residual is equal to an actual actual value minus the predicted value for uh, that x. Okay, so the actual value, maybe you have two bedrooms and five closets. And according to the model, if you have two bedrooms, we predict four closets then your residual is 5, the actual number of bed, uh, closets, minus what we predicted for a place with two bedrooms, 4. You would have a residual of plus 1. Okay, So the residual is the actual minus the predicted value for that x. And uh, what else do I want to say? OK. Oh, interpretation of the slope is, uh, so the slope is how much we expect uh, y to change, how much we expect y or predict y to change when x changes by 1. All right, maybe I should say when we add 1 to x. 
when uh, our x, how do you say x is increased by 1? Does that make sense? I don't know. Okay, I'll just write that. When x is increased by 1. Okay. Uh, and then correlation only makes sense, you know, r have it, you know, all of its interpretations of R only make sense when the data is linear, okay? Use only for linear data. Don't make predictions outside of the range where you've collected data. Watch out for outliers that may drastically affect your regression. Okay, so I think I covered that last week. And that's uh, that's all of the different methods that we've done. So, you know, I'll just I'll have a scenario and I'll say, well, here's some data and uh, and this is where it's coming from, you know, do this test find its p-value, what it, does the conclusion mean, or something like that. Okay. All right. Okay, and then so the last bit, I'll talk about those conceptual questions, and then uh, we'll probably be able to finish a little bit earlier early tonight, and I hope that's okay. So no, no, uh, no complaints here? <laughs> huh? Yeah, we could have... Uh, yeah, again, but then, you know, then I have to, I have to contact the school and say, you know, post this thing, and then they're like, well, when are you going to make up that hour? <laughs> yeah. Ah, whatever. Okay, anyway. Uh, all right, so conceptual stuff. Okay, let's see. So how can I get you guys to think about the things I want you to think about without actually asking the actual question? <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's see. Okay, so um, when you do a hypothesis test, okay, if your p-value Oh, okay, what what is what is the definition of a p value? That's a, that's a good good starter. Yeah, what do we have? We have a try um it's the probability of observing your data or something more extreme given that the uh the line box is That's exactly right. Okay, so the p value huh? Strong word. Yeah, very good. The p value is the probability of observing our data or something more extreme more extreme being more different from the null hypothesis the probability of observing our data or something more extreme if we assume the null hypothesis is true Okay. P value small. So uh, I should say when the p value is small, that is, um, p value is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. Um, that means we conclude that the alternative is true. Okay, so we conclude that the null hypothesis is false, and we conclude that the alternative is true. So it's we either reject or don't reject the null, and we either accept or don't accept the alternative. Okay. So maybe maybe I can say, so we we reject the null or we accept 
the alternative. That those two go hand in hand. Uh, and then we say we have evidence to support the alternative, or we have evidence to reject the null. Uh, those are also fine to say. Slash. Okay, on the other hand, if uh, when the p value is large, That is to say, the p-value is greater than alpha. We do not reject the null. And um, we do not conclude, uh, we do not conclude the alternative, OK? And, but it doesn't mean, OK, do not say that we accept the null. Okay? And we we just say we do not have evidence to reject the null. And we do not have Usually, it just means we do not have enough, well, or, or, or we don't have evidence, you know, to accept the alternative, OK? It doesn't necessarily prove that the null is true, though, OK? OK. And with hypothesis testing, the null hypothesis always has an equal sign. And there's actually no way to prove that a population parameter, whether it's mu or p or mu of whatever this, is equal to something else, OK? Unless you measure the entire population. That's the only way you can prove that the mu or whatever it is is equal to something else. When you're talking about the population, the only way you can say that it is equal to something is if you measure the entire population. But that defeats the whole point of statistics, which is what conclusions can we make without measuring the entire population. So, so we will never have the power to, to do this. OK, so you should be able to. Um, I guess, conceptually, say what each of these conclusions, what, uh, what is the appropriate conclusion for each of the different um, statistical tests. So for example, if I say, um, you do a hypothesis test for uh, let's say uh, let's say you do a chi-squared goodness of fit test, okay, and your p-value ends up less than 0.05, so you uh, reject. So this means what? Okay, and you know, or your p-value is less than alpha, whatever it is. Okay, so this means. What does this mean? We would say we have evidence that dot dot dot, you know, whatever proportions we had in mind uh, was not a good fit for the data. Okay, we have evidence that the whatever proportions we had in mind are wrong or something like that. Okay.
Okay, other conceptual stuff. Um, okay, let's talk about alpha. Okay, our significance level. is alpha. What is alpha equal to? Alpha is equal to the probability of committing committing what? Type 1 error? Okay. Alpha, our choice of alpha reflects You know, our willingness, quote, willingness to commit type 1 error. Okay. Okay, so uh, on the other hand, beta, what is beta? Beta is equal to the probability of type 2 error. And what do we call 1 minus beta? This is power, OK? All right, so let's just uh, review. What is type 1 error? We have type 1 error, and we have type 2 error. Type 1 error is. What did we do, and what was the truth? Yeah, the type 1 error is we, are, we conclude to reject the null hypothesis. But the truth, in truth, the null hypothesis is it's a terrible sentence. I should say, in reality, the null hypothesis is true. Okay. So our data, for whatever reason, led us to reject the null hypothesis. But the null hypothesis actually was true. We just happened to get some weird data that misled us. Okay. Type 2 error, we conclude what? We conclude, yeah, uh, not, uh, type 2 error is we conclude not to reject uh, the null, okay? But in reality, the null hypothesis is false, so we should have rejected it. All right, so power, what is power? If beta is the probability of committing a type 2 error, 1 minus beta would be the probability of not committing a type 2 error. And so that would be the power is the probability of correctly rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. Okay. There's technically another thing that's the analogous of 1 minus alpha. That's known as the specificity of a test. And that's correctly, basically correctly not doing false alarms. <laughs> okay. So like, um, usually, you know, this is, comes to like can cancer screening or things like that, diagnosing diseases. You want a test that is powerful or that is sometimes known as sensitivity. If somebody has cancer, you want to be able to say you have cancer. But at the same time, you don't want to, you know, freak people out 
if they're healthy, you don't want to say you have cancer either. And so that's known as the specificity. That's the other, that's the flip side. There are, yeah. It's, uh, but you, um, yeah, it's just, there's, there's nuances, right? Um, not guilty is not the same thing as innocent. And so we have to have all of the, the knots in there because, um, yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay, so uh, when do we want big alpha and when do we want small alpha? We want big alpha when which error is worse than the other error? So we want big alpha when type 2 error is worse than type 1 error. Okay? Because we get to choose our alpha as the researchers. Okay? We don't really have a choice over beta we ha or power. Okay? There are, you know, we didn't get into it in this class, but there's methods to calculate power, and it depends on a bunch of different stuff. We didn't get to it in this class. But we don't really have a lot of control in that, other than gathering more data. That's, that's the way to control power, is gathering more data. Um, but on the other hand, we get to pick alpha. And actually, choosing your alpha will affect your power. But um, so we get to pick alpha. We want a big alpha when the type 2 error is worse than type 1. And we want small alpha when type 1 error is worse than type 2 error. Okay, let me think what else what else goes into uh, this stuff here. Okay, oh, all right. Um, How does um, the alternative hypothesis being directional or non-directional affect the p-value? So what do we say? If it's non-directional, uh, like for example for a t-test, if non-directional, um, you know, for t-test, P value is always equal to two times the tail area. Okay. 
What about if it is directional? And let's let's just continue for a t-test because we didn't really talk about the other distributions. What do we have, what do we have to do? So, uh, well, we, we, we are tempted to say the p-value is just equal to the tail area, but that's not true, right? We, we have to check directionality first, okay? Must check directionality first. Okay? If directionality check passes, then the p-value is equal to the tail area. But if directionality check fails, okay, technically the p-value is equal to 1 minus the tail area, but we, there's several things we can say. Okay, If directionality check fails, we know that the p-value is greater than alpha, no evidence to support the alternative, and technically it's uh, p-value equals 1 minus the tail area. Okay, but the important thing is uh, we have to check directionality for stuff like this. what else I want to mention here. Okay. Oh, you should know, and we saw this already on quiz three, but, you know, how does or how do the results of a t-test for, you know, independent groups compare to results of a confidence interval for mu1 minus mu2. Okay, and um, I think we covered this, but basically the, the relationship is um, a non-directional t-test with uh, significance level alpha is equivalent to a confidence interval with 1 minus alpha percent confidence. Maybe we'll talk about just some big picture statistics things. So we've been focusing on all of this stuff, but maybe we shouldn't forget what <laughs> the big picture. Um, all right, let's see. So why are all of these statistical methods useful? Or why do we bother stati studying statistics? Yeah, so, um, so we can make conclusions. Okay, or we study statistics. So we can make conclusions uh, 
about the population uh, you know with just uh, with limited data I should say with limited data okay we don't need to observe the entire population um, So in order to make conclusions about the population, what must be true about our sample? Okay. So we want to say our sample is random, but technically it's our sample must be representative. Okay. So in order to make such conclusions, Our samples must be representative. Okay, random samples should give us representative samples, but it doesn't guarantee it. Okay, and you can also get representative samples through non-random methods. It is possible. It's, but the whole discipline of sampling within statistics it's a it's a it's a difficult thing to to actually do okay I know in all of our problems we just say here's a random sample but or here's a you know sample that should be representative actually difficult to pull off um, what else is uh, okay what's the primary difference between an observational study versus an experiment. What is the there's a few key differences. What's that? Active manipulation. Yeah. So in an experiment, treatments are assigned, okay? Treatment conditions are assigned in an experiment. In, in an observational study, just observations and measurements are recorded. Okay, no active treat, no assignment of treatments. Okay, with an experiment, given that the data supports such a conclusion, you can make cause and effect conclusions. You can make conclusions about the relationship of cause and effect. Observational studies, uh, you, should, you should not make cause and effect conclusions, okay? So no cause and effect conclusions. The, I don't know, maxim or whatever you call this is correlation does not equal causation. But again, I said correlation in statistics generally means we're just talking about two numeric variables, but probably association, but then and there's too many other meanings for the word associated with, so whatever. Correlation doesn't equal causation. That goes with observational studies. I mean, a lot of times it might point to some kind of causal relationship, <clears throat> but as good statisticians and practicers of science, we should not um, make these types of conclusions without doing an experiment. Another big picture stuff. Yes? So is that like when the guy did the study and said that vaccinations lead to autism? Was that more of an observational study and so he can't make a 
Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, okay. Other than the fact, uh, so actually, I don't know all the details. I just know that he did fabricate data for the study, okay. Okay. and so and then they they retracted the study, and um, and all sorts of stuff. So, and he got like not disbarred, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not disbarred, but whatever the equivalent is for the medical profession, they he got in trouble. Um, so yeah, I know in that in, with the autism and vaccines thing, that was there was fabricated data involved. So that's that's a different thing. But but yeah, you know, a lot of times there will be studies, and they will find an association between one thing and another thing. And it, and most of the time, it's or a lot of times these studies are just observational. Okay, and I don't know the. Uh, the holy grail that's being sought after in statistics is how can we make cause and effect conclusions from observational studies because you know in because of ethical reasons we can't always do experiments the way we want to right we can't we can't say you know is this drug going to kill you if you know how much you know we can't we can't do legal experiments on humans to find the fatal dosage of a drug, okay? That's, um, you know, we can kind of guess based on what happens to animals and stuff like that, but, you know, we, we don't want to do those types of things. We want to, so, anyway. Yeah, go on. No, no, I just read another study. They were talking about how people taking, like, Prilosec, extended group of letters, only supposed to be for 14 days, People who tend to take it extended have an increased chance of having uh, coronary. Yeah. Okay. So th yeah, that but that would be an observational study. Um, and so we should not jump to the conclusion that this thing, the drug itself, is causing these coronary issues. Okay. We should look and see, you know, is there something else in common? between these people who ex share this behavior, okay? Um, and maybe, you know, the people who share this behavior also tend to do other things. And that might be the thing, okay? We don't know. And this was actually how the cigarette industry or tobacco industry was defending themselves against um, people saying cigarettes cause cancer. They were just saying, they said, oh, I don't know if I already said this story already, but, you know, oh, people, these people were destined to develop lung cancer anyway, and so they were seeking something to soothe their lungs, and that's why they picked up the smoking habit. So these people were going to develop lung cancer. It's not our product that causes the lung cancer. It was just these people were genetically predisposed for lung cancer, which was actually what drove them to start smoking to soothe their, <laughs> I don't know, genetic condition. But, um, uh, you know, eventually they said, okay, this is bad for your health. But, uh, but proving something like smoking causing lung cancer uh, is actually difficult to do, you know, for humans. Because you can't just say, hey, let's do an experiment and have all of these children start smoking and see if they develop lung cancer by the time they're 30 or something, you know, that's... But if they would like to start smoking? Yeah, yeah well, and, but then again, the, then it would say, well, they wanted to start smoking, that was because they were genetically predisposed to do that thing, right? So, it's, it's hard to say. Okay, and uh, this is all the stuff I can think of off the top of my head. Um, I, I feel like the test is fair. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the uh, the course and what we've covered, and uh, this gives you a good perspective on classical statistical methods. Um, you know, if you're interested in studying more statistics, I encourage you to you know look into either a, a course on ANOVA, design of experiments; those usually go together, or on regression, or uh, you know if you feel comfortable with um, handling computer programming and stuff, you can look at uh, 
a Bayesian statistics course uh, with uh, generally maybe, or they might call it computational statistics. They're usually Bayesian and computational statistics go hand in hand. Um, unfortunately, UCLA Extension doesn't offer any of those courses. I would love to teach a class like that, um, but not enough demand. Uh, but, but you can do concurrent enrollment through UCLA. So uh, That's all I've got for today. Uh, we'll see you guys next week. Good luck as you guys study.